Bay. The journey from one premise to the cloud is is simple, right? It's just a matter of deciding to go and then pulling the trigger, right? Well, if you're here, you probably know that unfortunately that's not entirely true. And that's why so many companies are still on premise. That's also why Microsoft is giving so much attention and resources to organizations that want to take that journey. So today, that's what I wanna unravel with you over the next 30 minutes or so. And I want to start with a simple one minute video. Let's take a look at it together. So that had a little bit of a marketing flavor to it, but it hits some of the high points, right? There's a, there's a lot of good expectation about what you would get in the cloud, but there's a lot of frustration and complexity to getting there. So that's what we want to get to the bottom of today is go a lot deeper into what that little silly video did and give you some takeaways you can use to begin your journey. Quick introduction to me, my name is Jeff Abels. I run a firm called C5 Insight that I started about 20 years ago, and we focus on this area. We are Dynamics 365, Power Platform, and Microsoft 365 uh, consultants and architects. So we work across all of those from the business consulting side to rolling up our sleeves and helping our clients get the work done. And on the personal side, there's my family. My wife and I are empty nesters. We like uh, sharing fine wine and motorcycle rides together. And there's our newest little rider, Theodore, wearing his Harley Davidson shirt. All right, so jumping in, let, let's start with the why before we get into the how. And that's actually an important part of the journey. If you don't understand why, it's hard to get energized and to get budget for actually making this transition. The biggest reason why most organizations want to make this transition is more functionality, right? And what we have found is with Microsoft Dynamics, more and more of the functionality is either cloud first, in other words, it comes to cloud users first, or it's even cloud only. It's never going to be available on premise. Now, this rather detailed chart might be hard to read. I've got a download link there for you if you'd like to download a PDF of it. But this walks through when comparing Dynamics 365 online for sales to Dynamics 365 on-premise, the customer engagement version, what are some of the differences there? So some of the out-of-the-box improvements, first of all, improved mobile version with offline capabilities and some robust sales applications built into it. There are also tons of AI and process improvement capabilities available directly out of the box with online, the assistant, the playbooks, email engagement and tracking, auto capture of data, forecasting, business card scanning, customizing the opportunity close form. All of those are things that can do a lot to drive up productivity potentially significantly. There's also other smaller things like improved searching for keywords. People spend an incredible amount of time searching for the information they're looking for to get their jobs done in Dynamics. The online search experience is significantly better. Excel online integration makes reporting and data entry potentially much easier. Not to mention the better security, redundancy, backup and recovery options versus what most small to mid-sized organizations can support in their own data centers. It's going to be much better if you're online. Now, stepping away from those for a second and looking at some other capabilities that do require additional licensing fees, there's a huge list of sales premium uh, features. So if you want to go to the sales premium licensing, there's a whole new set of capabilities available there. There's also other integrated applications. So if you look at some of the other Microsoft applications available to you, integration with the Power Platform, much stronger if you're online. 
all the other Dynamics customer engagement applications like um, field service, marketing, those, and then uh, all the LinkedIn app uh, integration potential also there for you. So if you look at all the green dots uh, on the left side versus the yellow and red dots on the right side, you kind of get a quick image of what might the differences between these things look like. Now also thinking about why upgrade, it's, it's really about time. What I can tell you from our own experience is when we at C5 Insight are supporting on-premise Dynamics clients, we spend somewhere in the order of 10 to 20% more time doing things for them that we just don't need to do at all for our cloud clients. And that's not counting all the time that our clients' internal people wind up spending on things like that. And it can be very mundane administrative work. Things as simple as sometimes logging in for us remotely can require significant amount of time, upgrading servers, dealing with server downtime, um, realigning development and production environments, uh, the ever elusive Microsoft on-premise licensing reviews to keep them current on licensing. So all of this really adds up to really valuable resources, spending a lot of time doing a lot of work that isn't very valuable at all, but it's required to keep the lights turned on. And then there's thinking about the future. Will we be eventually required to make this transition? Now, about a year ago, Microsoft suddenly announced the retirement of SharePoint 2010 workflows, giving people only a couple of months notice about that. Thousands of companies had those running in their environment. Could the same eventually happen with Dynamics workflows as Microsoft tries to encourage companies to migrate to Power Automate? Maybe. Or could the same happen with Dynamics overall? Well, we know recently Microsoft noted that the mainstream end date for their latest on-premise version is much shorter than usual. If they'd followed their standard practice, we would have expected mainstream support to end around 2028. But instead, Microsoft kept it at 2026. So this causes some speculation that this might be Microsoft's target date to end on-premise completely. So in any case, Microsoft is clearly signaling they're less engaged in on-premise. And the final announcement will come at some point, hopefully with plenty of warning, but you never know. Let's talk about what the upgrade journey looks like. And what I've done is I've broken this down into four steps for you to make it easy to understand. So we're gonna look at how do you gather information about doing your upgrade? How do you analyze that information and create a plan? How do you execute it? How do you, do you now migrate and do your upgrade? And what should you expect on the other end of that? How do you test it? How do you improve on it? How do you take the next steps forward into your journey? Now, I like keeping things really simple. And if you know anything about C5 Insight, you've probably heard this before. But another way of saying these four things are, we're gonna help you to develop a plan where you can listen to your team, where you can really understand what you need in this journey, where you can connect, to execute your plan, and you can know what your results are so you can continuously improve. Listen, understand, connect, and know, we call that being powered by luck. And it's at the core of every human relationship and every system created to enhance human relationships out there, CRM certainly being one of the more important ones. So let's break these four things up, starting with listening. So when we think about listening and gathering information, we wanna start by listening to your own team, right? What are they dreaming of in the future? What are they struggling with right now? What do they not even know to ask about? That's actually kind of an important one we run into a lot where users are struggling with things that they don't even know that there's a solution to. So this page has got a lot of sample tools that we at C5 have used to listen to our clients' teams. There's more, but these are some of the most frequently used ones. Let's talk briefly about four of them. Workshops is one way. There are specific facilitation methodologies you can use to help pull better information out of your teams. Visionary demo, I love visionary demos. That's a way to get your team to start seeing things that they don't even know exist so they can start dreaming about new possibilities getting out of the box. Benchmark surveys is great for your CRM team because not only does it help you listen to and prioritize what your users want, it also gives you a benchmark, a mark you can come back to six, nine, 12, 18 months later and say, here's what our users were saying then, what are they saying now? And have we moved the needle for our users? That can be a challenging question to answer in a CRM project unless you take the time to actually benchmark, quantify the feedback you're getting from your users. 
But the one I want to talk more about right now is this ride-alongs one. Remember I said, what don't your users even know to ask about? Ride-alongs are a great way to just sit down, either you sit down or your partner sit down with some of your users and just say, walk me through a day in your life. Don't, don't talk to me about CRM per se in the context of what that day in your life is. Love to hear about it. But I want to hear about everything you do in your day. And all of a sudden you see, well, I've got to print this out and go get it signed by someone else and do this thing in Excel and send this email. And you as a CRM subject matter expert can start to say, there is an answer for that. I can bring a lot more efficiency to that process that you don't even know about. Or this upcoming version that we want to upgrade to is going to really help you with that. So I'm a big fan of ride-alongs. It's a really simple way to engage with your users. We don't have time to go into all these today, but here are three links for you where you can go and explore three of these four that I've highlighted here with a lot more depth around how do I do these things well to have a good plan for my project. So we start by listening to our team, but we listen a little more deeply than that as well. You want to listen to your CRM solution, if we can call it listening, right? So what you're listening for is what are my users actually using in here? How healthy is this? Is there dirty data in there or unused areas that I can get rid of? Is there something that should be modernized? Is there something that should just be left behind that we don't need anymore at all? And what might not pass the integration hurdles if I try to do it? So what I challenge you to, there's a table of contents right there, um, is put together some raw material to say, go through your CRM and answer these questions. Put reports together. There are some automated reporting tools out there. There's partners like us that have developed some of our own tools. Some of the stuff is not exciting, right? Looking at this one page coming out of the sample one that we did, it's not exactly riveting information, but it's very actionable. So this is what I call raw material. It's not what you give to your team to say, here's what I'm going to do. It's what you as a CRM administrator or the manager of your CRM partner looks at closely to say, let me use this to put the plan together. So I'm gonna create a better CRM for my team as a result of this project. Lastly, you need to listen to Microsoft and your partner as well. You need to understand what's going on with a roadmap and what's going on with a solution. The very first thing on this list, what licenses might be needed? Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, we're in CRM on premise, and so we're going to migrate that to CRM online, right? Well, once upon a time, it was that simple. It's not that simple anymore. There are many, many licensing types you can choose from when it comes to CRM online. So depending on what functionality you're using in CRM today, you're going to migrate your users to potentially different licenses than they were using before. Your sales users will probably migrate to sales. Your customer service users who are using case management might migrate to customer service. There's other blended things. If you look a little further down there near the very bottom of the list, there's multi-app users. What if you've got an inside sales team that's doing customer service type work, but also sales work? Will they need both licenses? Well, you need to understand that. And what will those licenses cost? Well, those are called uh, subsequent licensing options. If I have any one of the licenses, I can add additional licenses for a fraction of the cost of the first license. There's also free access to CRM to some extent available now. Some of these used to be called Teams licenses, but you can now with some of the very recently announced upgrades to Teams to Dynamics integration for Microsoft, some of your users who might be very light users may be able to have essentially free access to CRM via Teams to view certain things. There's also organizations who have built an XRM platform. So XRM basically means we've used the CRM stuff as a starting point, but we're not using a lot of the default sales, customer care, or marketing functionality. We've built these entirely new applications on top of them. So that's what XRM stands for, Extended Relationship Management. Well, it's not even pictured on here, but you might find you can save a tremendous amount of money by, mo by migrating those users to what's called a model-driven power app. That's a big topic. I can't get deeply into it today, but essentially what that means is it's all the same stuff that's in Dynamics except for the functional specific things, right? Sales marketing, customer service functions aren't really in that model-driven power app, but accounts and contacts and activities are all in there. And the ability to do all those other customizations you're used to are in there. And the cost is much lower. So you might migrate some of those users over to that kind of platform. And then there's all these new Dynamics 365 platforms that give you brand new capabilities that you should at least understand to decide if your company wants to leverage that 
ASAP sometime in the future, or it's really not a fit for you at all. So understand that. Also understand the last kind of big bullet with the two sub bullets under it there. What are the migration resources that are available to you? First of all, Microsoft has stood up an entire migration community just for Dynamics. That's a big link down there, but there it is. Web search will probably pull it up as well. You can go check out that community. It's got forums associated with it. It's got a lot of resources. Um, you can avail yourself of all of those things. So getting a lot deeper than what I'm talking about today, you'll see a lot of interesting things there. The other thing to understand is a new offering from Microsoft called Lifecycle Services. So the idea behind this is Microsoft is going to take the heavy lifting of migrating your customizations and your data to the cloud. Up until very recently, that was only for a very few select clients. Microsoft has now opened the floodgates for everyone to take advantage of the service. It is a free service. So for organizations that did not have access to this before, they were spending a lot of money with partner firms like ours to do this migration. Now they don't need to do that. A lot of that lifting is now handled by Microsoft. They do that through partners, but partners don't need to spend nearly as many hours doing that as they did before. And now if you're gonna have that budget available, you can use that budget for adding value instead of just migrating what you have to a new environment. Another place that's important to listen is to understand what those options are. Make sure you're taking advantage of them because you'll spend extra money and maybe have extra headaches and frustrations if you're not careful. Okay, step two, talking about understanding how do we, once we have all this information, how do we analyze the information and create a plan? One of the first places to start is really understand the costs and the savings associated with it. Notice this list. There might be a few things that are surprising to you here. First of all, the cost of migration. How much is it gonna cost in terms of human effort to do this? Might be something you do internally, might be something you pay a partner to do, might be some blended expense, but that's a part of it. What are the changes in licensing? I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. What are the storage cost difference? If you're on premise, you're not really paying incremental storage costs. Companies who have done that migration or are online are realizing they need a strategy for managing their online storage. There are better and worse ways to do that that uh, can cost more money and it can actually be more frustrating for users as well. So think through that on the front end. A really hidden cost that not many companies are aware of yet is API calls. API, the application programming interface, is really just a way that the computer talks to different parts of the computer. An application talks to different parts of the application. Every time a user loads a page, they look at the lead form, for instance, that's an API call. Every time an integration fires to synchronize a record between Business Central and Dynamics uh, CRM, for example, that's an API call. Every time a workflow runs, that's an API call. Now, Dynamics comes with a bunch of those API calls built in. Microsoft is still perfecting their licensing plan for all of this, so it's a bit of a black box for us right now. But we do know at some point, when you reach a certain number of those calls, you will run out and you will have to pay for additional calls on a month for by month basis. So be aware of that and understand what the implications might be depending on in particular how you're integrated with other applications. And then remember the long-term service costs overall are involved as well. And that's actually usually an area of cost savings. As I mentioned before, our clients who are on premise spend a significant amount of their services budget doing stuff that's the care and feeding for on-premise dynamics that's totally unnecessary for online. So get your head around those costs and benefits as well. Now, one thing I want to point out here that's a bit of a surprise to some organizations is this, this is an actual five-year TCO, total cost of ownership, uh, assessment we did for one of our clients recently. And I've circled in orange the difference in the annual recurring licensing cost. So if you're on premise as they are, you might look at it and say, all right, our on premise annual costs for software assurance, right? We already own the licenses. Now we're just paying for that software assurance every year. That's $35,000. Going to Dynamics Online, we're gonna pay per month or per year, depending on how we set it up with Microsoft, but essentially almost $80,000, more than double the licensing cost to go online versus on-premise. So if that's your only reason for going, you're gonna stop right there. You need to understand what are the other reasons for migrating. If it's purely a licensing cost spend thing, it's not gonna make sense. 
understand when you get online licenses, you're getting a lot more than just your license. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen in your shop, with your partners, with your hardware that Microsoft just takes care of for you, in addition to all those other nice features you get. Be aware of that. Don't be shocked by that when it comes up. Have a plan that takes it into account. Now, you also need to, in this stage, you've done your analysis, you need to create your plan, right? You, you've gathered the information in the listen step. No matter how small you are, understand that a plan is critical. It may not have to be big, it may not have to be sophisticated, but don't think it's quite as simple as just saying, hey, Microsoft, here's my stuff, or my partner, here's my stuff, throw the switch and put us online. You're gonna wanna have a little bit more of a plan to understand what to look at. What does that plan potentially need to look like? We kind of see four broad categories here. It can be more of a lift and shift plan, keep the costs low, just get us to the cloud as quickly as possible. If there's messes that need to be cleaned up later, we'll clean them up, but get us to the cloud, functional, but don't worry about doing anything special, anything new. There's a modernization approach, which is we still wanna keep costs down, but let's modernize some of the old manual processes using some of the new ways of doing this. Let's replace old JavaScript and code and stuff like that, maybe using business rules and Power Automate and that kind of thing. Then there's the reimagine approach, which is there's a world of new functionality out there and new ways to do things. Let's plan for how to leverage that right now. If you're like a lot of organizations, if you don't, what happens is you just move it over and you're off to other things. This might be a great opportunity for you to say, let's take a generational leap forward in what we're doing to make this work better for our teams. And then the last one that a fair number of companies are choosing is saying, look, we've learned a lot of lessons. Our CRM has become really complex and we wanna rebuild. We'll migrate the data over, maybe cleaning it up a little bit, but we're gonna rebuild all the configurations and customizations again from scratch to learn the lessons we need to learn. So four basic ways to think about it. Part of your planning process is recognizing which one of those is you and how will you tweak that to your particular needs. Now we're into the third step, right? This is where the action is. We're gonna connect, we're gonna actually do the migration and the upgrade. One thing to point out, and this really is throughout this four step process, but here's, here's where it plays a really pivotal role is communicate throughout the process, right? Change management is not just providing training. You see that in the last box there. Is training important? Sure it is but behavior change, permanently changing the way people do things, that takes a lot more than training. And a broad communication plan is a really big part of it. Remember I started this presentation talking about why. That's the first and most important step. Understand your why and communicate it throughout the process to get buy-in at all levels of your organization. There's a lot of little tips in this slide, take it, throw out the ones that don't work for you, add new ones that work for you, but don't throw out the idea of communicating Failure to communicate is the reason why so many CRM projects fail to begin with. Now, if you're going to be working with a partner, there are three broad models for working with a partner. There's the support only model, sort of the, hey, we the client are gonna own most of this, but we want a subject matter expert that we can call from time to time to get through thorny issues or to validate our thinking on things. There's a co-manage approach. Hey, we're gonna have resources at the client, the partner company is going to have resources and we're going to partner together to do this. And then there's the implement outsourcing approach. And that is, hey, partner, you do everything you possibly can. The hardest one of these to get right is the co-manage one. And that's because it's hard to know whose job is whose, right? That takes a lot of discipline. I want to also point out on all three approaches, there's absolutely roles that are very important for you, the client, to take on. You can see the user testing role. There are other ones. I called that one out in particular because this is one we see as a bottleneck very frequently where everything is kind of ready to go. But you know, if you're doing a construction project, you got to do that final walkthrough on a punch list and then a final, final walkthrough after the punch list to say everything is ready to go. But clients can have a hard time prioritizing their time to do that. And it can either become a bottleneck or a sore subject when you go live with something that's not really quite ready to go live yet. Fourth and final step is know your results. So this is where your testing comes in, but also your continuous monitoring and improving. So kind of going around that tree there, make sure you do your testing before you go into production and expect to, to try to migrate at least a couple of times before you're really ready to go. Sometimes it'll fail a few times and you need to clean things up before you can move everything over. 
Go back to what you said you were going to do in your plan. Make sure you're delivering on that. And if there are gaps, build that into your plan for the next step. Don't forget to communicate, right? It's about changing behavior. It's not just about upgrading software. And remember, this is a continuous process. So do a good job in this final step, gathering more information so you can use that to front load the next step, going back and making this work even better. There are all sorts of new features you're going to want to take advantage of. Make sure you're positioned well to do that. So summarizing, four steps for successful migration. It's all about being powered by luck, right? You're going to listen, gather all the information you need, put the raw material together. You're going to understand, look at all the information, put a plan together, don't fail to plan because you'll almost certainly fail overall if you don't have a good plan in place. Then connect, then actually implement, do the migration, do the upgrade, communicate throughout. And finally, know what your results are, expect and plan to continue to improve, continue to do new good things for your users and your business throughout the life cycle. Look, Dynamics Online offers some pretty cool technology, but remember, it's not about that. Ultimately, this is about people, your customers and your coworkers. And when you deliver the right technology for them, they are going to deliver the profit to the company. So just be careful not to get so hung up on the cool technology that you lose track of the people because people are really what this is all about. Thanks for coming today. Uh, my name is Jeff Abels. I work with C5 Insight. We help organizations use digital workplace tools like Dynamics, like Power Platform, and like Microsoft 365 to become powered by luck. If you want a copy of today's links, if you missed any, please just email me. I've got an email template ready to go. I'll send those right out to you. If you like the idea of powered by luck, go grab a copy of the book on Amazon. There's a link for you where you can go grab a copy. And in fact, I'm excited that one of my colleagues has a soon to be released luck principle uh, approach to developing a sales process that will also go out on Amazon. And if you're looking for a partner to engage with on this, this is what we're in business to do. So reach out to me and let me know. We help with this migration type of work, but we also provide full end-to-end -end partner services to our, to our clients. We'd be happy to work with you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. And if we have time, we'll take a few questions. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, we really only have just a couple of minutes for questions. I've been monitoring what's been coming in here. I'm um, going to hopefully answer the one about uh, preparing for the data licensing when you go online. Uh, enough. So let me do one real quick that I've heard before when I've presented this, assuming that it might be something that's on your minds a little bit. And that is, you know, this is great. There's a lot of good information about preparing and planning and all that. But really, if we just wanted to kind of lift and shift as rapidly as possible, tell us what the quick steps are, or a quick overview of them are to get it done. So here they are. First of all, work with your partner to get engaged with Microsoft Life Lifecycle Services. You don't want to miss that opportunity uh, that's become available within the last several months here. Next, you're going to extract your data and customizations, and you're going to give those to Microsoft so that they can load them into the online environment. Once that's loaded into a sandbox or development environment in the cloud, you want to make sure you do quality assurance. You go in and do the technical testing, make sure everything is working, whether it's your integrations, which might need to be either modified or even completely rewritten, uh, or the customizations you've done in the system. Make sure your users do user acceptance testing, save your solution updates. Once you're satisfied everything's working, remigrate the data and go into production. That's a super high level. I think we're out of time. Thanks everybody so much. Hope you find that helpful.